G'day everybody and welcome to Laws 11061 Contracts A, Topic 9. My name's Anthony Maranac and this week we're looking at the construction of contracts. So we've now had a look at um, what we mean by the terms of a contract as opposed to the representations which might have been made during pre-contractual negotiations. So we've got to the point where we know what the words of the contract actually are. We take a step forward from that this week and uh, start to look at what the court will do in order to work out uh, what the actual meaning of those words um, is. Now bear in mind that there's often going to be disputes about the meaning of those words and there's often going to be, uh, in fact I, I can't almost can't imagine a um, contractual dispute where there's not at least some level of disagreement about what the meaning of the words actually is. So the construction of contracts um, is really a, a critical element of your analysis of a contractual dispute if the dispute is emerging from uh, the actual performance of the contract. So what are we going to do this week? Well, we'll start by looking at the basic fundamental um, rules for construction, which are the most important of which the golden rule is that we construe a contractual provision according to its clear and express meaning. Then we're going to look at the circumstances in which a court will look at uh, the matrix of facts, the matrix of circumstances surrounding a contract in order to assist the court to understand what the contract is actually intended to mean. Then we'll look at how we can construe some specific types of clauses um, which you will see come up all the time in contracts and these are the ones which most often result in contractual disputes before the courts. So we're going to look at a termination clause, a force majeure clause, don't worry about what that means at the moment if you've never come across the term before, I promise all will be revealed. We'll look at how to construe and apply an exclusion clause and then finally we'll look at uh, one of the uh, final rules of construction of contracts uh, which is called the contra proferentum rule. So let's start with clear and express words. Now, if you're a, a, uh, a lawyer writing a contract, and especially if you've done my um, statutory interpretation and legal drafting course later on in your degree, you will know that the best type of legal writing is clear, express, easy to understand, not requiring a law degree type of legal writing. Okay, You will hear me say in that course over and over and over again that the best English is plain English. If you write a contract and the nature of the contract is such that it can really only be understood by another lawyer, you've written a bad contract. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first reason, obviously, is that it's most helpful to your client and, for that matter, to the other party to the contract if um, it can be understood by the people whose lives are going to be affected by the contract without them needing to pay for a lawyer. But there's a more important reason even than that. And that more important reason is that if a contract is written in clear and express words, that's what the court will apply. So in other words, the more clearly that the contractual provisions are written, the more likely it is that the court is going to interpret the contract in the way that you intend it to be interpreted. Let's say, however, we're dealing with someone else's contract. So a client has come to you with a contract that they've signed, a contract that they're bound to, and they say, look, I've been told that this contract carries this particular meaning and that doesn't sound right to me and it's not what I thought I was signing up for when we signed the contract in the first place. Can you please have a look, interpret the contract and tell me if you read it the same way? How are you going to do that? Well, the first rule you'll apply is that it, the clear express words prevail. Now, how do we tell where the words are clear and express and how do we tell what the meaning is of those clear express words? particularly in a language like English, where we can have the same word with several different meanings. Well, 
To do it, we apply yet another objective test. So ultimately, we're going to be asking ourselves not what did the, con the parties mean when they wrote this contract, but rather what would a reasonable person understand to be the meaning of these words. Now, if a reasonable person would look at a contract and say, well, these words are clear enough and this is the reasonable meaning that I would attach to them, then that's the meaning that the words bear. Strangely enough, they bear that meaning even if the result would be unexpected. Even if the result is pretty clearly not what the parties intended. If they have reduced the contract to writing and they've used a form of words in that, con in that written contract which is clear and has an easily understandable meaning, well then that's what they've bound themselves to. The High Court has said that if, however, there are two constructions, both of which seem to be pretty clear on the basis of clear express words, well, under those circumstances, the court will consider implying or construing the meaning of the contract according to the, the meaning which makes more sense. What the court actually said is, if the language is open to two constructions, that will be preferred which will avoid consequences which appear to be capricious, unreasonable, inconvenient or unjust, even though the construction adopted is not the most obvious or most grammatically accurate. So what does this tell us? Really it tells us three things. If we get a contractual provision that we're asked to interpret and there is a reasonably uh, obvious clear meaning or a couple of reasonably obvious clear meanings open on the face of those words. Well the first rule is the clear express words have to prevail so we can't go hunting around for other alternative meanings we have to use one of those basic clear ones. The second rule is that it still has to apply even if it would end up uh, with a, an outcome that was never anticipated by any of the parties. The third rule however modifies that a little bit and says look if there are a couple of possible interpretations of this sentence each of which has a pretty clear express um, is a pretty clear express meaning of those words then the court will prefer the one that seems to be closer to justice. What you can't do when you're interpreting provisions of a contract is be tempted to rewrite the contract in your own mind. So let's say there's a contractual provision which clearly um, doesn't seem to capture what the parties were intending to capture when they made their bargain. But the words are still pretty clear. They still make it pretty obvious what the, uh, what the, the obligations of each party are. And each party has incorporated those provisions by signature as we discussed last week. Well, you can't really go back and revise the contract. Crystal clear is crystal clear. So you have to apply the provisions according to what they say, not according to what they were intended to say or according to what you wish they would say. What do we do, though, if there really aren't any clear express meanings? And this will happen much more often than you think because, sad as it is to admit it, Many lawyers and many contract lawyers are absolutely terrible users of the English language. Quite often this happens because lawyers try to write in a way which is too complicated. They try to write using sentences which are much too long. They try and write using language which they may not even fully understand. Most importantly, they write without a full understanding, a full and comprehensive expert understanding of the use of grammar. So we do end up, unfortunately often, in a situation where we will look at a contractual provision and say, as far as I can tell, this doesn't actually have a meaning. It doesn't have a meaning that I can apply sensibly to the circumstances of the contract. So what do we do 
in that situation. The first thing the court will do is look at what they describe as the matrix of surrounding circumstances or the objective framework surrounding uh, the circumstances. And so what that means is that they're placing the contract in context. If the contract is for the purchase of goods, then the court is thus enabled to say, how do we read those words on the understanding that the intention of the contract is to allow for the purchase of goods? If the contract is for the transfer of a business entity from one corporate structure to another corporate structure, well, the court can read the contract in that context and say, what, what meaning do we attach to these words in the contract now that we know that the, the overall purpose is to transfer a business entity from one corporate structure to another? What this means is that a poorly written section of a contract can still be saved, it can still be understood, a meaning can be attached to it because the court is able to look to those surrounding circumstances to find the meaning. Don't be fooled though by the presence of this process. You should only be looking to the surrounding, the matrix of surrounding circumstances if you can't easily identify or if you can't identify the clear express um, meaning of words. If you have a section of a contract which when you look at it does have a, a clear and express meaning you can't then say well look despite it having that meaning we want to change the interpretation of those words altogether and in order to do that we're going to focus on the surrounding circumstances. The court will say no. If the words of the contract have a clear meaning, that meaning will prevail. So that's our basic rule. That's our starting point, if you like, um, for the interpretation of a contractual provision. There are a bunch of specific provisions, specific types of provisions, which you will find uh, throughout contracts, which require much more careful rules of uh, interpretation. And the reason for this is that these are the sorts of clauses which most often result um, in the most bitter contractual disputes. And so uh, each of them has developed, if you like, or the courts have developed a, a series of well understood rules and processes for interpreting those contractual provisions. The first one we're going to look at is exclusion clauses. What is an exclusion clause? Well, an exclusion clause limits the liability of one party if they don't meet their obligations under the contract. So, a very common sort of exclusion clause is uh, if you went into a parking, a paid parking area, um, and if you actually stopped at the entrance to that parking area and read through all of the provisions, what you would find is that somewhere tucked in there, there will be an exclusion clause which says that the parking operators are not liable for any damage to the car, no matter as you know, regardless of how the, the damage is caused, whether by um, negligence or intention or any other um, manner whatsoever. Okay, so that's an exclusion clause. What they're saying is. We want to exclude from our business any potential liability for any damage which is done to your car while it's parked in our parking alley. If an exclusion clause is in a contract, and if it is signed, if it is incorporated by signature, well then the rule that we discussed last week in um, Lestrange and Graucob will apply. Okay, if someone signs an exclusion clause, it'll be given effect. This is so even if the clause is, unclear, is um, unfair, which exclusion clauses usually are, because they're usually imposed by the stronger party to the commercial negotiations on the weaker party to the commercial negotiations. Okay, whenever anyone hands me a contract um, in my own personal life, 
the first thing that I go to is to look and see what exclusion clauses the other party is trying to impose on me. What happens, however, if the exclusion clause is not signed? And this happens very often, of course. Um, and the example that I gave you just a few moments ago where the uh, parking alley has put up a sign, well, I'm not signing anything. Okay, that, that clause is incorporated by notice, not by signature. In that situation, how will they interpret the exclusion clause? Because I haven't specifically signified my agreement to that clause, I haven't signed anything, how will it be interpreted? Well, there's a few rules. The first rule is that the notice of the exclusion clause must be given before the contract is formed. Have you ever seen those situations where you might drive into a uh, shopping centre car park and um, after you've driven in, after you've obtained your ticket, so after the contract is formed, there'll be a sign up somewhere on the wall that says, park at own risk. Well, that's a pretty crude attempt to impose an exclusion clause. And it's also completely ineffective because the notice of that exclusion clause is being given after the contract is formed. You see, if you got in there and you saw that park at own risk sign and you decided, well, I don't really want to park my car at my own risk. Part of what I'm paying for here is for the security of my car. So um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not happy with this. Then... Um, you decide to leave, you've still got to pay on the way out. You've still got to pay the fee. So obviously the obligations had already been put in place before that sign, that park at own risk sign, uh, was made known to you. In that case, it wouldn't be effective. Okay, Notice of exclusion clauses has to be given before the contract is formed. And this was, uh, this was the basis of the decision in Ollie and Marlborough Court, where... Um, Mrs. Ollie put a lo a, a, an expensive fur coat into a locked room in the Marlborough Court Hotel and it was subsequently stolen. And they pointed to a note which had been posted which said, yep, we'll, essentially said, yep, we'll store your goods for you but we're not going to take any, uh, any liability if they get stolen. And that exclusion clause was not considered to be effective because it was not brought to her notice until after the contract was formed. The second rule for exclusion clauses is that if an exclusion clause is um, given notice in a way that constitutes misrepresentation, then it's not going to be valid. This is the basis of... Uh, one of those contract cases that's become quite famous over the years called Curtis and Chemical Cleaning. Now this this was a uh, case where Mrs Curtis wanted to get her wedding dress uh, professionally cleaned and um, I was married about two years ago and when my wife came to have her dress professionally to clean, cleaned I was absolutely staggered by the hundreds of dollars that it costs to have a wedding dress cleaned. Um, if you want to make real money, apparently, don't go into the business of law, go into the business of cleaning wedding dresses. She handed the dress over, Mrs Curtis, and she was asked to sign a receipt. Okay, and it was given to her, this document, as a receipt. Now, that seemed strange to her, and it had seemed strange to me. I mean, I've never really been asked to sign a receipt before. She had a look at the receipt and she saw an exclusion clause. She asked about it and the staff member said, oh look, it applies to damage to sequins and beading because obviously wedding dresses are very likely to have sequins or beading and um, the, the sequins or beading just because of the nature of their attachment to the dress are much more likely to be damaged. And so the girl behind the counter said, that's, that's what that's all about, it's about your sequins and beading. On that basis, Mrs. Curtis signed the receipt and um, left the dress to be cleaned. It came back with a stain. She, of course, was very unhappy with this. 
and uh, and sought to take legal action. The cleaning company relied on the exclusion clause which was on the receipt. Now, because it was given to her as a receipt, this was not a clause which could be said to have been incorporated into the contract by signature, because a receipt is not a contract. But it was a clause which was shown to her before the contract was finally concluded, before she'd handed over her money and all of that sort of stuff. And so the court was prepared to consider whether or not this provision had been included by notice. They found that it had not. And the reason it had not is that the girl behind the counter had misrepresented the nature of the clause. You see, if the girl, if the words given by the girl behind the counter had been accurate, well then, the cleaning company would have had to make good their damage because it wasn't damage to the beading or sequins that Mrs. Curtis was worried about. It was a, a great big stain on the dress. Because the girl behind the counter had misrepresented the nature of the clause, the clause was found to be ineffective. This is the case even if the, misinterpre- yeah, the misrepresentation is not deliberate. I mean, there was no suggestion at any point in this particular matter that the, uh, the staff member from Curtis Chemical Cleaning had deliberately tried to downplay the extent of the exclusion clause in order to get Mrs. Curtis to leave the, uh, um, to leave the dress. It was entirely innocent. But still it was a misrepresentation. And the fact of that misrepresentation was enough to uh, make the clause void. The third rule for exclusion clauses is that they are construed contra proferentum. Contra proferentum, which is is, uh, is a Latin term, means against the interest the interest of the proferens, or against the interest of the person who brings the clause forward. So in other words, whichever party is seeking to rely on the exclusion clause, whichever party is seeking to have their liability excluded by the clause, they give up the benefit of the doubt. So if there are two possible uh, interpretations of the exclusion clause, the interpretation which will be applied will be the one which is most in favour of the party not relying on the exclusion clause. So the exclusion clause, in in other words, will be read down to give it its minimum reading, not its maximum reading. It will exclude as little as the words allow, not as much as the words allow. This is obviously um, a a great advantage to the, the party which has not signed the exclusion clause, but it's also a very good reason for making sure that exclusion clauses are written extremely carefully. There are three more rules to look at in terms of exclusion clauses. The first one is that the excluded conduct must be within what we call the four corners of the contract. So, what we can suggest is that any contract takes place within a a sort of an understood set of real world circumstances. We know why we're making a contract. We know what the general meaning of the contract is going to be. Even if there are disputes about the details, or even if there are quite fundamental disputes, there are still going to be many points of similarity where both parties share the same understanding. If one party or another steps outside that, and harm is caused, should they be able to rely on the exclusion clause? Well, normally one would say no. I actually think the example that I've given in the notes uh, for this week captures that situation quite well. Let's say you've got an awesome car. And you take this car down to the garage. And you, you're getting it serviced. You leave it with the garage... You come back later on to pick it up, 
and it's got a great big dent in one of the panels. And you're understandably furious, and you say, well, <laughs> you're going to have to pay a lot of money to get this repaired because it's going to have to be repaired as good as new. And they say, nah, there's an exclusion clause in the uh, contract that you signed this morning. And you do a bit more digging, and you find out that what's actually happened is that one of the apprentices has gotten excited about the idea of this luxury car and wanted to take it for a ride. And so when the morning smoko came around, he's jumped into the car and taken it down to the nearest milk bar and it's been dinged on the way. Now, when you left the car with the garage in the morning, it was within the four corners of the contract. It was within your sort of reasonable understanding that someone might have to drive that car. For instance, once the work had been done on the car, it might be necessary to conduct a test drive. If the car had been dinged up on, in the course of that test drive, well, you'd have to say that the exclusion clause would probably apply because what was being done when the car was driven was pretty much within your expectations of what was likely to happen when you left the car uh, with the garage at the start of the day. On the other hand, you'd never left the car with the garage with the intention of providing transportation for an apprentice to go down to the milk bar. So to that extent, the exclusion clause should not apply because what was being done when the damage was caused was well outside, well outside the four corners of the contract. There's a very specific variation, well, I think it's a variation of the four corners rule. Um, most of the textbooks regard it as an entirely separate rule, but you, you'd, you'd be the judge and let me know what you think. And it relates to contracts for transportation. They call it the deviation rule because what it says is that if the transport um, operator deviates from a reasonable route, then any harm which is caused in the course of that deviation will not be covered. The case which people look at for that is TNT and May and Baker. In this case what happened was that a truck uh, collected goods but was not able to deliver the goods on time because uh, well, not able to deliver them in the normal fashion because the driver was just too late to get to the depot at the end of the day. And so what the driver decided to do was uh, take the car, the, the truck with uh, all of the goods on board back to his place, leave it at his place overnight and he'd go to the depot first thing in the morning. All in all, probably not a, an extremely uh, silly thing to do under most circumstances. Only thing is, Murphy's Law applied on this particular night and the truck caught fire and all the goods were damaged. So, under those circumstances, should an exclusion clause apply? Well, clearly not. Because whilst it may have been within the contemplation of the person... Um, in this case May and Baker giving up the goods it may have been within their contemplation that the truck driver might have chosen whichever seemed to him to be the most convenient or effective route for travel it was never within their contemplation that the goods would be stored overnight outside a suburban household instead of being stored overnight at a proper transportation depot as a result the exclusion clause could not apply now to me Again, this is pretty much covered within the Four Corners Rule because you could just as easily have said that parking the truck at his home was not within the Four Corners of the contract. Um, however, perhaps the best way to see it is that the, uh, the Deviation Rule is an extension or a specific case of the Four Corners Rule. The final thing to note about exclusion clauses relates to the Australian Consumer Law, which we're going to be looking at in a great deal more detail um, in just a couple of topics' time, in Topic 11. One of the things that you'll learn then is that the Australian Consumer Law contains a whole raft of consumer protections, consumer guarantees. Those provisions cannot be excluded. So they cannot be excluded by law. You cannot have an exclusion clause by which one company purports to exclude rights that a consumer is given 
under the Australian consumer law. So we'll reflect back on that uh, when we get to that material in a couple of topics time. So that's exclusion clauses. Main thing to remember is that if an exclusion clause has been signed, it will probably apply. All of these rules that you're looking at on this slide right now, these are rules which apply if the exclusion clause is not signed, uh, but rather is uh, incorporated by notice. Next type of clause to look at is what we call an entire contract clause. Now last week we looked at the parole evidence rule. And the parole evidence rule said that where there, you have a contract that's been reduced to writing, you can't change the meaning of that contract by introducing oral evidence of what was actually intended. Once it's, once it's in writing, it's in writing. The parole evidence rule can be reinforced by what we call an entire contract clause. An entire contract clause says that this written contract constitutes the entire contract between two parties. In other words, it says very explicitly, look, you can't go outside this contractual document and find other stuff and say, no, 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 this other stuff is all supposed to be part of the contract as well. It doesn't work that way. Okay, the entire contract is as written uh, in, uh, in that particular piece of writing. This means that any emails, any discussions, anything at all, any advertisements, anything which form part of the process of communication between the parties prior to the signing of the contract is now completely dead in the water. I always suggest that if you're presented with a contract and there is an entire contract clause there, you should think very, very carefully about whether the contract really does encapsulate everything which you need to have in there for your protection. Quite often, entire contract clauses are included uh, by lawyers or in the case of a standard contract without anyone really thinking about what their implications are. And they can, in the end, cause as many problems as they save. If you come across one, think carefully. Put yourself in the position of a dispute. Think, if I was bringing this before a court, is there anything outside the contract that I might want to rely on? If so, you either have to nix the entire contract clause or change the contract itself to bring that material directly within the contract. Okay, let's move on now to termination clauses. Termination clauses set out the circumstances in which either party can terminate the contract. Last week we talked about the difference between a warranty and a condition. To revise briefly, a condition is something that is so important within the contract that if it is breached, the innocent party should be able to terminate the contract. A warranty, on the other hand, is a clause which is not quite at the same level of importance. So, if it is breached, the innocent party would be entitled to damages rather than being entitled to terminate the contract. We also talked, however, about the fact that it can be very difficult to tell what is a, a warranty and what is a condition. And once you add intermediate clauses into the mix, it becomes even more complicated because if a clause happens to be an intermediate clause, you then have to work out whether the breach is significantly, is, well, I was going to say significantly significant then, whether the breach is sufficient to allow the party to terminate the contract. A termination clause can put this beyond doubt. So a termination clause can say, here are the circumstances which we as the parties feel would justify terminating the contract. In essence, what the parties are saying is, these are the provisions which we regard as being conditions. These are the provisions which we regard as being so significant that a breach of them would enable the innocent party to terminate the contract. The other thing that a termination clause can do is set out the process for terminating the contract. Now this is important because if the parties do that, that process must be followed. This was what happened in the Commonwealth and Amman Aviation 
Aman Aviation won a contract to uh, patrol Australia's northern waterways looking for, uh, basically for customs and immigration um, uh, offenders. At, the, at that point in time, um, the main immigration concern was what were referred to as Vietnamese boat people, uh, or basically refugees uh, fleeing from um, Vietnam in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and also uh, the continued overfishing of Australian waters, um, generally from uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. So these uh, Amman Aviation won the contract, but they had been unable to secure the appropriate aircraft and pilots, and they weren't going to be ready to start when they were meant to start. And so the, Con the Commonwealth decided to pull a plug on the contract. The only thing is that the termination clause in the contract said that before the Commonwealth could pull the plug on the contract, they had to provide Amman Aviation with a, what, um, what we call a notice to show cause, basically a warning that they were about to pull the contract. The notice to show cause would say, listen, we're going to pull the contract unless you can show us why we shouldn't. Now the Commonwealth failed to take that step. Instead they just terminated the contract. The court found against the Commonwealth because the termination clause had set out a mechanism for terminating the contract and the Commonwealth had failed to follow that. So if there is a termination clause, it doesn't only convey rights but it may well also require a procedure to be followed and if that's the case the procedure must be followed. Finally we come to what's called a force majeure clause. Now this is not law Latin, this is law French. Um, for those of you who have studied a little bit of uh, uh, history you'll know that in the early parts of, um, of uh, what we might call modern Britain uh, following the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and the invasion uh, by William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror was French, he was a Duke of Normandy. And so for a long time uh, within the ruling class of Great Britain, the, the key language was French. And so quite a bit of our legal language uh, comes from Old French. And force majeure is one of those clauses. When we talk about a force majeure event, we're talking about a disaster. So we're saying, what happens if a contract cannot be completed because of an unforeseen disaster? Disasters might mean natural disasters, such as a um, cyclone or a hurricane or perhaps a drought a snowstorm, an earthquake. Force majeure events might also be uh, acts of war and they're also what are sometimes regarded as acts of God, Okay, which might be something like a lightning strike out of nowhere. What a force majeure clause will do is set out who is going to bear the liability. What is going to happen to the contract if it suddenly can't be completed because of a force majeure event? Usually what will happen is that the, the contract will agree for both parties to uh, be restored as much as possible to the position that they were in before the contract. So the idea is that neither party should make a windfall gain and neither party should suffer an unreasonable loss as a result of the force majeure event. You need to be careful with force majeure though, for two reasons. The first is that the disaster must make it impossible to complete the contract, not just unprofitable to complete the contract. In the notes I've described the case of Wilson and Tenants, which was a, a, a case around the time of the First World War, um, for the supply of magnesium chloride. Now what happened is that because of the uh, First World War and the results of uh, the, the uh, lack of trade during the First World War out of Germany, um, the price of magnesium chloride went through the roof. And so the company said, well look, we could probably still supply the magnesium chloride, 
but there's no way that we can still supply it at the same price that we had previously indicated because the price has just gone through the roof and the reason the price has just gone through the roof is because of acts of war so because all this has happened as a result of a war we're going to say this is a force majeure event wrong it was not a force majeure event because it didn't make it impossible to complete the contract it just made it unprofitable unprofitability on its own does not make a force majeure event second thing to know is that not any disaster not just any old disaster is going to result in a force majeure event I've looked I've put two pictures there on the slides of the sinking of two large vessels now the first one was the cruise ship Lusitania the cruise ship Lusitania was shot was uh, destroyed during the First World War by a, a German submarine it was full of civilians it was regarded as an absolute outrage at the time that this event had occurred amazing story if you should ever go and read it now this was clearly an act of war when you have a submarine which uh, fires upon a civilian vessel and destroys it that's pretty clearly an act of war then we look at the next ship which is the Titanic now I'm sure that everyone has seen terrible Leonardo DiCaprio movies about this event and nobody really needs me to tell you that the uh, Titanic struck an iceberg now a Titanic struck an iceberg because the crew were negligent the Titanic struck an iceberg not because of any act of God not because of any sudden it's not as though they were blown onto the iceberg by a hurricane or anything like that they simply didn't see the iceberg and didn't get out of the way now there's no doubt that the sinking of the Titanic was a disaster particularly if you happen to be on the Titanic but it wasn't a force majeure event it wasn't something which was outside the control of the parties it wasn't something which just happened so you have to ask yourself was this event which is being claimed as a force majeure event was it genuinely a disaster that couldn't be predicted or controlled by the parties or is this something which flowed on as a consequence from the conduct of the parties so there's a bit about the construction of contracts first golden rule keep in mind at all times that if there are clear express words in the contract they must be given their full effect even if they have an outcome which is quite unexpected if there are a couple of competing sensible interpretations of the words the court will quite often look at the surrounding circumstances to try and work out which meaning should be given effect we've talked about exclusion clauses and in particular we spent a lot of time during this uh, lecture talking about the rules for exclusion clauses if it is attempted to, in to uh, incorporate them by notice if they're not signed this is something which comes up time and time again um, in contract law and also it's something that tends to come up time and time again uh, in contract law examinations and assignments so beware finally we had a look at some of the other types of clauses entire contract clauses termination clauses and force majeure clauses and we looked at how to interpret those and how to give them effect all right hopefully all of that has been uh, some useful reinforcement to you from the notes and um, we're getting now decidedly close uh, to the end of the term and um, and making great progress which is terrific uh, Enjoy this week's research and uh, I'll look forward to talking to you again next week.